Rhodes from Fine Art Connoisseur. Today I'm pleased to interview Mr. Jack Rutberg. Well, the focus of the gallery is uh, modern and contemporary art, European and American, and that in is inclusive of all the Americas. But it's really Western culture, Western civilization that intrigues me. I, I don't know much about Asian work, as, uh, for example, and I don't deal in that area. Um, but it's a, there's no hierarchy in terms of uh, paintings, drawings, prints, sculpture. Uh, the criteria, be it something that's very inexpensive or very expensive, is that it is something that has to be worthy of being in a museum collection. And I think a lot of collectors or aspiring collectors or curiosity uh, you know, uh, seekers and, and who go to galleries might be really surprised to find out that things that can be many hundreds of dollars, for example, are worthy of being in museums and are collected by museums. Uh, there are works of great mediocrity that are approaching a million dollars, and there are works of remarkable excellence and historical value, even part of the canon of modern art that are still accessible in this world. So, anyway, we cover the gamut, and um, uh, but with a few soap uh, soapbox speeches as to as to great areas of interest and conviction as well. Well, you know, I, it's different for everyone. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to look at art history books. Reading them is great, but look at them from old masters right through the continuum of art history. And you walk through those areas and you step through them and you see how works are informed in the history of their day. In, in, and uh, it doesn't have to be work, you just, it's the joy of looking. And the more you look, the more you learn. And I think it's hugely important to understand the context of the day when these things were done. You know, for example, um, Printmakers at a particular time in history were the radio, television, and newspaper of their day. This is a means of communication. Before the invention of the camera, someone in London, for example, would be fascinated with what someone in, uh, looked like in Morocco or life and fashions and, uh, or, or, or the fashions of Paris or the natural landscape. These were extraordinary uh, experiences. So who cared about what an artist felt? It was profound enough to see how things really were. Well, when the invention of the camera, suddenly you had a kind of whole new instantaneous depiction of life as it really was. And it liberated artists to be more introspective and interpretive. And it gave license to vision. Now, there were always those exceptions prior to the invention of the camera, of those artists that even took the narrative and brought a unique characteristics and qualities to them. And that's why people like, uh, whether it's Albrecht Dürer or Rembrandt or whoever, um, resonate today, or, or you know, the, the bizarre sort of provocative works of uh, Hieronymus Bosch and, and the likes. I mean, one doesn't have to go to that extreme to find nuance. But Modern art really begins with the, with, with the invention of the camera. When one understands that, one understands the backdrops of history uh, and music and literature, um, it opens up new worlds for you. And one doesn't have to become a scholar of this. In the 20th century, we see a new sort of vision with, with the inventiveness of Picasso and the like and you know one just has to walk through that process it's the nursery rhyme to the lullaby to the you know beautiful Schubert or Mendelssohn or Stravinsky going forward and the visual arts has its same equivalent people complicate the process with the visual arts but we've all experienced it with music 
I always say, you know, when you were a kid and you were in, say, junior high school, and, you know, we used to listen to the radio and the top 40 music would come on and a song would come on and you hated that song. It was awful. It was offensive. And they kept playing it. And after a while, you couldn't help yourself. You were humming along with that piece of music. And then if there was a girl in the next desk that I had a little crush on and that music came on, suddenly it became our song, you know. So this was... This is the process with the visual arts. One shouldn't complicate it. Go to museums. You know, I used to go to museums when I was in my late teens. I didn't know anything about art. I had no background. Did, didn't study it in school because I was involved in music. So I was removed from the visual arts. Whenever other kids were studying that, I was playing the violin in the orchestra, you know. And I remember going to museums as this teenager this, on those melancholy days when I needed to be alone. And, and I'd walk in and I'd go into the, the old masters and the impressionists. And that kind of resonated. It was easy access, relatively speaking. And I'd walk into these contemporary galleries and look at this junk. You know, funny enough, I kept going back to see that junk. And I felt compelled to go back. You know what? Some of it still is junk. Some of it is awe-inspiring. Yeah. Well, we live in a time where I think the bar has been lowered, and that has been lowered by the Academy. The Academy has always lowered the bar. The Academy today is the, is the mainstream of art, and we can't forget that. When we thought of the Academy in, say, the 19th century, late 19th century, these are the people that held back the moderns, the Impressionists and fo forward. Today, the Academy has been issuing curriculums. And all you have to do to declare yourself an artist is to fulfill a curriculum. And you are given a certification that gives you a BA, then an MFA, and this says you're an artist. And most often, all you had to do was conceptualize things. Now, I'm not suggesting that conceptual art isn't valid. It certainly is, and there's genius there. But the solution to the problem of how to make a determination is to place all these conceptualists in halls of philosophy and allow the vacuum of these ideas to implode to see who's really standing. Because I don't see great profundity. I see a time that we're living in where we have a look at me sort of dynamic, where artists have this kind of group therapy by virtue of look at me, look at me. This is a grown up version of the child doing this. And what they have presented us are not necessarily works of profundity that will stand up hundreds of years later. To, we're still looking at great. We're looking at great Degas. We're looking at great, um, you know, Durer and, and, and uh, Caravaggio, etc., etc., etc. I don't know what we're looking at today. And I don't know that because that's 2020 hindsight, which is the clearest lens that we have. But I do think that the Academy, which has been co opted by clever, trophy hunting conceptualists, who are teaching the generations of artists are, for the most part, failed artists. And they've justified a new paradigm by not having to show the results of genius. At a different time, artists studied with mentors, their masters. They were great teachers, not always great artists, by the way, but quite often they were great artists and they had schools of artists that followed them. And this went right through modernity. But today, with the invention of the academy and art schools, which are hugely invested in hundreds of millions of dollars to sustain them, these are no longer the halls where that gem emerges because of a muse. And that's the element that's missing. And that's not something that one can conceptualize. That's something that is inherent. It is that 
very special genius that comes rarely in, in, in any area, but it certainly is not going to come through the fulfillment of a curriculum where, in fact, you very seldom have to even produce something as an example of the fulfillment of that curriculum.